Okay, so to conclude our session today, uh, we're going to have a panel case discussion on a recent case of a mitral valve edge to edge repair that was done at our institution here at the IDMC. Uh, so on this panel, we'll have myself uh, and I'll be joined by Dr. Faroz Mahmood. Uh, Dr. Mahmood is a professor of anesthesia at the Harvard Medical School. He is the division director of cardiac anesthesia, as well as the network chief of cardiac anesthesia services at Beth Israel Leahy Health. Also joining us on the panel will be Dr. Marie-France Pellin. Uh, Marie-France is an assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard School of Medicine and also serves as the associate director of structural heart disease clinical services here at BIDMC. Our plan is that we will go through this case. Uh, we'll have a, a in-depth discussion about the, each aspect uh, the, of the case. And then we will conclude with a panel discussion where all the speakers from today along with the moderator, uh, Dr. Wendy Sang, uh, will go through audience questions. So with that, uh, we will begin our mitral valve edge-to-edge -edge, uh, case discussion. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the case discussion portion of the uh, Structural Heart Disease uh, Symposium for this uh, Toronto Perioperative Echo Symposium. Uh, my name is Dr. Aidan Sharkey. I'm one of the cardiac anesthesiologists at the BIDMC, and I'm joined here by Dr. Marie-France Poulain. Uh, Marie-France is a, a assistant professor of medicine at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, she's an attending uh, structural heart disease interventionist and also the associate director for structural heart disease services here at BIDMC. And I'm also joined on my left here by uh, Dr. Uh, Feroz Mahmood. Uh, Feroz is a professor of anesthesia at the Harvard Medical School. Uh, the Director of Perioperative Services at BIDMC and the Network Chief, uh, Chief for uh, Cardiac Anesthesia Services at Beth Israel Lehi. Uh, and so today we're going to go through a mitral valve edge-to-edge -edge repair case. Um, and this is a bit more of a complicated case than our, our typical case. And it has a couple of kind of good learning points that we're hoping to uh, get across to our audience. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and we will um uh, give a little introduction to the case uh, so here we have a elderly gentleman uh, who had a significant cardiac history including a previous sternotomy for a bypass he has a copd a chronic kidney disease and also atrial fibrillation and he had severe symptomatic mitral regurgitation uh, despite maximum uh, guideline directed medical therapy and on a preoperative echo, he had a complex Barlow's valve disease with a P1 flail, which resulted in severe mitral regurgitation. Other things to note on his uh, echo was he had normal biventricular function, he had moderate tricuspid regurgitation, and also um, had moderate pulmonary hypertension. And of note, he had multiple recent hospitalizations for heart failure symptoms. And so with that, he was uh, referred to, uh, first of all, the surgical team uh, who deemed him to be a high risk candidate and subsequently was referred to the uh, structural heart disease team here at our center at BIDMC. So I'm going to start off the first question to, to Mary France and uh, just to briefly tell the audience, Mary France, you know, what is the, the structural heart disease team? Who does it uh, entail? Yeah, um, so usually patients, regardless of where they're coming from, uh, they get to be seen by both an interventional cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon. We review all of their pertinent history and imaging uh, together. We talk with the patient and uh, tell them which therapies would be best, whether it's percutaneous or surgical. Um, and in that case, um, this patient is, you know, a patient who would qualify quite well for, for tier like we're going to talk about. Very good, very good. Uh, and so, um, with that, after his referral to the the structural heart disease uh, disease team, a uh, mitral valve edge to edge repair was uh, was deemed to be a good therapeutic option uh, for this patient. And uh, uh, Mary France, in terms of offering a tier to these uh, patients, you know, uh, where in the guidelines, you know, does this fall in terms of this patient with a with a complex, um, you know, degenerative disease? Yeah, so this patient has primary MR um, and he's a high risk surgical candidate. So actually he has a two way indication for for tier. Um, he's highly symptomatic, uh, high risk, like we talked about, um, and he was deemed um, and he was um, seen by our team and agreed that his anatomy was amenable for tear. 
Um, so uh, in that case, this is like we're going to see it's not the typical anatomy that for patients that are uh, that were studied in the Everest trial. Um, it's a little bit more complex, but it's somebody who has a, a two-way indication for uh, an intervention, for a, a percutaneous intervention. Okay, very good. Um, and so um, we moved ahead with the procedure, and um, this is our first images that we got here. Uh, and we can see here we have our, our mid-esophageal four-chamber view. Um, you know, we're seeing a bit of the aortic valve here, so, you know, we're more than likely close to the anterior lateral uh, commissure, and we can see an obvious uh, posterior leaflet flail with the resulting very eccentric jet of mitral regurgitation. Um, and just looking at a few other images, we see a commissural view here. Um, and again, we see that much of the regurgitation uh, is originating mainly at the anterior lateral commissure. Um, and then, you know, finally, we're looking at our, you know, long axis view. We can again clearly see a flail um, and the severe mitral regurgitation. Uh, so, for us, when you're doing, you know, these exams on these patients, you know, what is your initial imaging approach to to deal with these patients? So, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. And secondly, getting to the question that this is a you know complex case, and most of these patients who are getting coming in for edge to edge repair have been extensively worked as far as the severity of mitral regurgitation is concerned. The intraoperative or the periprocedural transesophageal echo examination is more so to localize the site of regurgitation and to devise a clip strategy. So in these patients, like you alluded to, we are very uh, you know, uh, fond of this monoplane examination of the mitral valve, which consists of moving the TE probe from the upper esophagus, going over the anterolateral portion of the mitral valve, then to the middle portion, and then finally going to the posteromedial component. And as you can see in this view, uh, which was confirmed by the transcommissional view, that this is a flail or abnormality that is involving the more lateral and the anterior port anterolateral component of the mitral valve. And uh, the clip, first clip is to be deployed based on this regurgitation jet, either entirely on the lateral side or more lateral to the central, that is A2P2 component of the mitral valve. Very good. Um, and so, you know, next we moved on to do a, a, a three-dimensional uh, image. Uh, and for us, you know, what, uh, looking at this image, you know, what are you thinking about this valve? So first of all, this is an ONFOS, uh, what appears to be is a, a single beat uh, acquisition of the mitral valve, which is a rather low frame rate, but still you can appreciate the, the position of the aortic valve, the left atrial appendage at nine o'clock position, the aortic valve at 12 o'clock position, the smiley face or the surgical on fast view of the mitral valve, and what appears to be a flail posterior leaflet uh, somewhat lateral to A2P2 and comprising the A1, uh, A1P1 uh, portion of the mitral valve. That's what I can confirm over here with a flail uh, with, a, uh, with a coaptation defect between the two leaflets. Very good. And then, um, you know, we, we did our due diligence. We did a, you know, a 3D on fast uh, image of the mitral valve with color, and we can see, you know, severe mitral regurgitation here. And now, for us, you alluded there that the previous image and, and this image was a single bead image. And as we saw in our case history for this patient, he has a history of atrial fibrillation. So we're unable to do a uh, multi gate acquisition on this patient. So in patients like this with atrial fibrillation, you know, what is your strategy for really uh, interrogating the valve from an echo point of view with 3D? So likely first point is that as we acquired this uh, image with color flow Doppler, uh, you know, uh, information, this is more so for the aspect of completion and comprehensiveness of the exam, and it doesn't really add much to my pre-existing knowledge of where the regurgitation is coming from. And it is a pathetically low, you know, frame rate and so, therefore, of not much value at this time, or, uh, you know, strategy in these patients in whom we cannot use, uh, you know, a single beat full volume acquisition with low frame rate is to use a narrow sector live image, which on the left, as you can see, the elevational width has been reduced significantly to increase the frame rate to around 69 hertz, which you cannot even get with uh, multi gated R wave, R wave gated acquisition. So, that's a high frame rate examination. You can even see some torn cords on the on the P1 scallop of the mitral valve. And then you can gradually increase the elevation width, which on the right shows a rather wider sector, 
where you can see not only the anterolateral portion of the mitral valve in question, but also exclude other abnormalities by gradually increasing the, you know, uh, elevation width, albeit with a significant reduction, but still an acceptable uh, frame rate of about 32 words. So that's our strategy to use a narrow sector of our examination of the mitral valve, which is life. Yeah, yeah. moving it back towards our patient, um, you know, so we've identified that, you know, this patient has uh, severe mitral regurgitation. We've identified the location uh, of the regurgitation. Um, you know, we've shown on uh, both 2D and 3D that there is a, a flail segment. Um, and we know exactly where, where the regurgitation is coming from. So next we did our due diligence by uh, performing a complete examination. So we have a transmitral mean gradient of three millimeters of mercury. Uh, we have a flow reversal in the right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, we did a 3D planimetry at baseline and we got you know, quite a large mitral valve area. Um, and then we also did our due diligence and looked at the, you know, the flail gap, the flail width, and we also got our posterior mitral valve leaflet length. Um, Mary France, I have a question for you. You know, we, we, as echocardiographers, you know, we routinely get all these images. And how do you, as a interventionist, you know, utilize or, you know, what do these numbers mean to you? Yeah, no, these are actually critical. So this is how we're gonna decide which clip we're gonna use, uh, which therapy we're gonna use and where we're gonna put the clip. So uh, this is all very important. So we know that the valve area is large enough to accommodate. So we're not, because the downside of the percutaneous options is mitral stenosis, right? So that's what we're trying to avoid and have a great result, meaning no, no significant uh, MR left. So with all of these, this information, I can tell that this is a large valve with a file width that is large, but not too large. Um, and the only concern that I have is that it's a little bit commissural, which can make it a little bit more tricky. Um, but we're going to get into that later. Uh, so, Feroz, um, you know, given the information we have at the moment, uh, we know this is going to be a, a edge to edge repair that's going to be slightly commissural over in the anterior lateral commissure. Um, you know, in terms of planning our transeptal puncture, you know, what is your, you know, your plan for this patient in particular? So that's a great question because, as Marie France alluded to, that the concern is that this is more or less a close commissural or close to a commissural flail, which makes it critical to have as little motion of the clip under the valve as you possibly can and do minimal readjustments of the device above and below the valve. So you want to have a straight line, which is goes from the point of transeptal puncture onto the anterolateral one and our plan and in retrospect which also proved to be correct was to do a rather posterior transeptal puncture so that looking at this at this uh, you know graphic also you can appreciate that a posterior and when we go on to look at the three uh, on fast view of the mitral valve you will recognize that this was in actuality a very uh, optimally done uh, transeptal puncture based on our discussion so we do spend a lot of time deciding where to do the transeptal puncture before we go in there yeah, yeah. Feroz, you've talked about the transeptal puncture plan. And now, Mary France, I'm going to come to you and ask about, you know, based on um, the images we've seen on the Echo, um, you know, what are you thinking from an interventionist point of view on, you know, what might the CLIP plan be for this patient? Yeah, so this is a, a wide uh, flail, a, a, a large flail with a wide gap. Um, and a little bit commissural. We always try to see if we can get it with one clip. Uh, so for this, I would try to plan for uh, a wide and long clip uh, and try to see if we can, um, exactly. So uh, the XTW and try to see if we can um, have enough reduction in MR without creating MS with this. And if not, then we'll see what we can do after that. Um, but the four, I just got to say that the fourth generation of the mitral clip is really, really nice. Um, it's allowed us to have a straighter trajectory when we cross the ventricle. There's less movement that's happened. There's more precision in the movements that we make. Um, and um, with the independent grippers, it's, it's been really a great uh, change to the field. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So for this patient, you know, uh, we had decided we would start off with an XTW, uh, as Mary France alluded to. You know, try and make this a one clip case, uh, but knowing that given that it was qu quite a large uh, uh, flail gap and flail width, that a second clip may be needed. Um, okay. 
Um, and so for us, um, you know, this is our, our transept of puncture that we performed, uh, you know, so we can see in our bicaval view, you know, we're quite inferior. We can see in our short axis view, we're quite posterior. And then in our four chamber view, you know, it looks like there's adequate, um, you know, uh, septal height uh, or, or, or depth. And so, you know, was this a satisfactory puncture in your opinion? Yes, and then honestly, as part of our training program, we always do this thing is to put the color flow Doppler on the, after the septal puncture has been achieved to demonstrate where exactly this was, you know. So this gives you a little immediate uh, feedback. It gives you an immediate, uh, you know, gratification or knowledge that sometimes the 2D is like insufficient to tell you where exactly the puncture happened. But, the, and this positively identified the specific location what we had planned before, and that was to go relatively inferior and posterior to achieve a straight uh, alignment with the with the anterolateral commissure of the mitral valve. And I think this and is we, highlighted. Uh, sorry, you uh, go on first. And as you can see, it's, if you look at this on pass view, uh, in respect to the aortic valve, we are rather posterior. And if you move this, you know, this uh, the point of uh, puncture of the septal puncture, which was very posterior and very inferior. Which means away from the aortic valve and close to the uh, to the you know inferior vena cava, you can see that you have a rather straight line of the of the sheath when it enters, and it will fall directly over over the you know the anterolateral commissure of the mitral valve, as we'll see in the later clips. Yeah, uh, very good. So yeah, so we were happy with our initial you know transeptal puncture, um, and so you know with that we went on to the the following stages of the procedure where we, you know, under echo guidance, we, you know, we, we dilated up the septum, uh, we introduced our clip delivery system, um, constantly doing this under echo guidance, uh, we had placed a wire in the left upper pulmonary vein, and, um, you know, we're synchronous with, you know, the interventionist maneuver, uh, as they maneuver their uh, clip delivery system across the septum, you know, we are always in synchronous motion with them uh, to to guide this this uh, clip delivery system so that we know exactly where it is the whole time. There's no point of the case where we are doing anything blindly and uh, we're constantly under visual guidance. Um, and so here's a clip where we are, um, you know, we have our clip delivery system and we are now guiding the clip. Uh, it's come out of the clip delivery system. Um, and here we are just beginning to uh, cross or to maneuver uh, uh, the Coumadin ridge uh, to go over the valve. Um, okay, uh, and so Feroz, I have a question for you in terms of, we talk about trajectory and orientation. What exactly do we mean by these? So the trajectory implies the approach of the clip to the valve, which means the more orthogonal the approach is, the more vertical the clip is in relation to the plane of the mitral valve, both on the AP view, which is on the right side of the screen, as you can see, and in the medial lateral direction as well. So that's the trajectory and that is approach of the clip to the plane of the mitral valve. The orientation implies the orthogonal or non-orthogonal or uh, relationship of the clip arms in relation to the mitral valve coaptation point. Ideally, we like that to be orthogonal as well, which means when open, the clip arms should be between 12 and six o'clock position, if you are referring to an on-fast view in the form of a clock with the aortic valve being at 12 o'clock and the left atrial appendage at nine o'clock position, the two major anatomical landmarks. Okay, so now we're gonna move on. We have, um, we have our, our clip and in terms of orientation here, you know, so for us, uh, how would you orientate, uh, how would you guide uh, the interventionist in terms of orientation? So first, you know, order of business is our interventionists are very smart people. They really don't know, don't need to know where they are. We need to tell them where they need to go. So because just telling them the where they are is no information. So first order of business is always tell some positive information and not negative information. Tell them where they need to go and not where they are. And secondly, the two most important landmarks in relation to orientation are the position of the aortic valve, which should always be kept at the 12 o'clock position and the appendage as this, in this case, uh, on at nine o'clock position. And avoid the parallax error, which means the image should be as on FOSS as it possibly can be. Because if you tilt it on the sides one way or the other, it is quite possible to place the clip more medially or laterally or more anteriorly or posteriorly if you are not getting a true on view of the mitral valve. 
So the aortic valve is at 12, and the appendage is at 9 o'clock position. That's the key part in keeping a, any orientation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mary Franz, at this stage of the procedure, from an interventionist point of view, you know, what are you kind of, uh, what's going through your mind at this stage of the procedure? Yeah, so I, like Farrell said, so the way, if we always have the imaging the same way and we talk the same language, it's going to be so much easier to communicate and know what we need to do next. Uh, so um, if you just go back one, so we can, we can, we don't know yet if we're above the jet or not, but we're going to, yeah, exactly. So now we're trying to position the clip above where the maximum jet is. We're going to want to make sure that it's perpendicular to where, um, to both leaflets uh, before we cross. And we're also going to have test the grippers. So which one is the anterior, which one is the posterior, so that we, if we need to do independent gripping of the valve, of the leaflets, we'll be able to do that. Um, yeah. So we do our final adjustments before we cross the valve. Um, and then, especially since we're commissural, we're going to want to make sure that we're as perfect as we can as we go in. Yeah. And then another thing, you know, we tend to do is, um, you know, we tend to, you know, put the patient on apnea. So we, we take them off to ventilation uh, to see what the effect of, uh, you know, that reduction in the intrathoracic pressure has on the position of the clip. And so we can see here that, you know, when we did do that, there was a bit of a medial drift, um, you know, uh, with the clip. Um, and so uh, knowing this, uh, you know, we readjusted. Um, so subsequently, we we crossed the valve, um, and for us, in terms of after we cross the valve, you know, this orientation does not look uh, the same as it was before. What would you say? So again, again, uh, going on the, the clock face, which is you know shown graphic on the right side, this clip to me appears to be a little bit more anteriorly than it is. It needs to go more posteriorly, and I think the clip arms are between kind of one and. 6.30 to 7 o'clock position and not really 12 to 6 o'clock. So I would ask Marie France at this stage to move the clip a little bit more posteriorly and rotate it counterclockwise about five degrees. Very good. And, you know, just because we are we are beyond the valve at this stage, we, um, you know, we will reduce the, the 3D gain so that we can really see the orientation uh, as the clip is beyond um, in the left ventricle, beyond the, the, the valve leaflets. Um, <clears throat> and so at this point, we're really constantly transitioning between, you know, commissure, long axis, 3D on fast views. Um, and we can see here in this, you know, commissure view that we are, you know, kind of where we wanted to be in terms of being, you know, slightly more medial um, to the A1P1 or or lateral to uh, A2P2. So this looks like we're in a pretty good, um, you know, uh, position with this clip. Um, and so, you know, with this clip, uh, Feroz, I might get you to talk us through, we are trying to grasp the leaflets here. So we are essentially below the, below the valve and you're trying to uh, put, secure the leaflets between the grippers and the clip arms. And as you can see in this long clip, you're rather getting very easily the interior leaflet and the grippers are moving, but we're having trouble. And with all this beautiful maneuvering, uh, we were able to put this, you know, uh, secure the posterior leaflet at the same time. And you can now confirm by motion of the grippers, we're going to go through the same thing over again. And as you can see that this is, you know, both the leaflets have been grasped between the, between the grippers and the clip arms, and we have closed the clip to about 60 degrees. So that's, that's our protocol to see whether we have, uh, you know, achieved where we are. And we, again, flip between the AP as well as the transcommissional view to confirm that it is exactly at the location that we want it to be. Yeah. yeah. And that's where we're going to spend a lot of time, right? Because that's going to be the critical part to ensure that we not only have leaflet, but have enough leaflet. So we're not going to have a leaflet, single leaflet detachment after. Yeah. Exactly. And this is a good example about what Marie France alluded to earlier about individually grasping each leaflet. You know, that was a good example of, uh, of that there. And <clears throat> so, you know, we, we tend to close under color. Um, and so, Marie France, given all the images we've seen before, um, you know, are you happy to close uh, at this location? So before we finally close, we want to make, you know, we want to check a few things. Um, we want to make sure that where, where we want it to be. So the clip is exactly where it's supposed to be. We have enough leaflet, uh, like we talked about, so that there's not going to be any detachment and that there's the gradient looks um, 
well, we'll check the green once we're closed. Uh, but we want to make sure that we have, we're in the right place. And so far, what I'm seeing looks good. It looks like we're where the, the MR is. Very good. So we went ahead and we closed, um, you know, the clip at that location. Um, and, you know, this is what we are left with. Um, and so, you know, we can see here that there's still, you know, residual regurgitation. It is reduced. Uh, however, there is still a uh, residual regurgitation. So at this stage, you know, it's, it's our job as echocardiographers to, you know, do a couple of things. So we want to first, you know, where is this coming from? You know, and is there room to optimize um, the location of this clip or is there room to do a second clip? Um, so as my France alluded to, um, you know, first of all, in terms of uh, locating where this MR is coming from. And we can see here, we did a monoplane examination and we saw that this was coming, you know, lateral uh, to the first clip. Uh, so that's what we figured out where the regurgitation was coming from. Uh, we next did a transmitral gradient and we saw the transmitral gradient was two, you know, so there was potential space um, for another clip. Uh, we then went on to do a 3D image and really on this 3D image, we can just see with color that there's still regurgitation coming very lateral uh, to this clip. Um, and then on uh, 2D imaging, we can see that there is a residual flail segment. And again, this was uh, lateral to where we initially placed uh, the clip. And then Froze, I might get you to talk us through this. You know, we did another 3D examination um, and we can see a good tissue bridge. However, what else are we seeing here? This clip is only for Marie France because she likes it. But I you can it. see in this one that there's the clip in the middle and there's a rather flail, residual flail segment of the posterior leaflet, which is uh, very well highlighted by this circle. So our, our plan was to carefully approach this specific uh, segment because we wanted to take care of this regurgitation jet and we, we had a decent enough gradient to go for another clip in this patient. Okay. Uh, so, Mary France, in terms of a, uh, from a procedures point of view, you know, what are your concerns and in terms of second clip, what's the plan in terms of, you know, what clip might we use and um, what are your concerns uh, from your point of view? Yeah, so now that <clears throat> we have a, excuse me, <clears throat> so uh, this clip actually looked pretty good, so keeping it was the right thing to do. So now that we want to go but a second clip, we're going to be more uh, commissural even. So it's going to be uh, important to avoid touching the first clip to avoid any uh, movement of that clip. Um, and uh, the good news is that, you know, we still have a low gradient and plenty of room. So putting a smaller clip uh, would be the way to go. So a smaller clip lateral to it, we're going to be very careful as we advance it. Um, and that should take care of the residual MR. Okay, so that was the plan. We were going to uh, go lateral to the first clip and um, look at using one of the NT clips. Uh, so here we can see, you know, uh, our decision was to place the second clip and then we went ahead and, um, you know, uh, placed this clip, you know, very carefully, knowing that it was very commissural um, and we placed this clip lateral uh, to the first clip. And we went through all the, you know, stages that we've already talked to about. We, you know, um, you know, we went uh, below the valve uh, and we individually grasped each leaflet uh, we confirmed grasping um, and then we closed under color. Um, and so here we see um, this is uh, this where where we deploy the second clip and we can see a much, um, you know, a better reduction in the degree of mitral regurgitation. So for us, you know, we've now two clips placed. We have a pretty decent reduction in the regurgitation. Uh, do you think this is an acceptable result or do we need to further optimize or even place a third clip? Uh, I, first of all, the thing to check is that we have not created any stenosis before we detach. And secondly, once we have, I personally think, I mean, eventually it would be Mary Francis' decision, but I personally think that we have more than two grade reduction in micro regurgitation. And if you have a decent uh, gradient, uh, we'd accept this uh, result and declare victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so, my friends, in terms of, you know, you're looking at these images and you're also probably looking at the, you know, the V-waves, uh, hemodynamics, 
Um, and I think we saw a good reduction in the V waves at the time. You know, what are you thinking from an interventionist point of view? Oh, uh, I think you're muted, Mary France. Apologies. Um, so, yeah, so I'll ask you to show me a little bit more uh, in terms of gradient and imaging, but so far I'm very happy with what I'm seeing. Uh, we know at that time, in that case, we noticed uh, an decrease in the V waves and increase in the systolic pressure, which also, which is always a great sign uh, that we had a great reduction in MR. Um, and you'll show us, but the, the gradient, uh, the MR was actually quite reduced uh, and the gradient was acceptable. So. Yeah, um, and so we went on, we did a, you know, a final 3D image. We can see, you know, where we have a good tissue bridge. Uh, we have our, you know, classic double orifice. Uh, we're not seeing any more flail segments. Um, you know, as uh, both speakers alluded to, we, we looked at a transmitral gradient. We were getting a gradient of two, which was, you know, very acceptable. Uh, you know, we also went ahead to uh, measure each individual um, orifice. And we were getting, you know, quite a decent uh, mitral valve area, you know, a combined area of, you know, 3.8 centimeters squared. So, you know, a very acceptable mitral valve area. Uh, we looked at the, the right upper pulmonary vein, uh, which pre was, um, had a reversal and post, you know, we see a good, uh, good flow in the, uh, the right upper pulmonary vein. Uh, we looked at our iatrogenic ASD. Um, and we had a unidirectional, you know, left to right shunting. Um, and, you know, just overall looking at the pre and post, uh, this is our images. Um, and so, Mary France, from your point of view, uh, successful case? I, well, it's always, uh, we always let the uh, echocardiographer decide. So you guys tell us. But from my standpoint, it looks pretty good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, Feroz, from your standpoint? First of all, I'm very flattered for making this decision over here. But again, I said it's uh, we have more than two grade reduction in mitral regurgitation severity. There's acceptable gradient, and we have objective evidence of, you know, uh, re from reduction from severe to just about trace to mild MR. Yeah. I think it was one of the better clips we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that brings us to the end of this case. Um, you know, I think this case was at a couple of complexities. It was a, first of all, it was a patient with Barlow's disease which is not typical for our, our tier interventions. Uh, second of all, it was a patient who had a commissural pathology, which again, um, you know, is not our routine. Um, and uh, lastly, this is a patient who, you know, had to undergo, have two clips placed, which is again, you know, is not your standard. So I think this case encompassed uh, a lot of good points. Um, and, um, you know, I hope uh, people got a bit out of this. Um, and I hope to answer any questions that there might be in the uh, panel discussion after this case. Uh, I would like to thank my both panelists, uh, both uh, Dr. Mary France Perlan, Dr. Feroz Mahmood for their insightful thoughts. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing your thoughts in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So that was um, that was a great case there, and and there's actually a couple of uh, audience questions for us. I'd like to um, get addressed first before we move on to um to tr uh, before we move on to lunch to try and get those in, and sort of seeing that first that case that you just presented the the lesion was very much in the medial lateral sort of middle to the lateral side of the valve. And it kind of, there's this question from the audience saying, do you have a formula regarding the optimal site for the transeptal puncture according to the site of where the clip you want to place the clip? And I'm going to direct this to Dr. Sharkey if he could answer that. Yeah, uh, so, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Wendy. Um, so, you know, we don't have a, a specific formula that we follow uh, uh, rigidly. You know, we look at every patient uh, individually, um, but for, for lead, Lesions, you know, uh, for the majority of lesions, we find that going mid fossa, you know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, slightly more inferior, slightly more posterior, um, will be able to to tackle most lesions. And the issue arises with the more commissural lesions, uh, especially the more um, uh, medial lesions, where you really need to concentrate on getting adequate septal height. Uh, and so that's where you need to, need to spend a bit of time. Uh, to ensure that you get adequate septal height for those real commissural lesions. But for the vast majority of cases, with the routine cases, I think mid-fossa is where you're going to, you know, have good maneuverability with the, 
uh, your transeptal puncture. Okay. That was great. Now I'm going to direct a question to uh, Dr. Nyman here. So you did a lot of like, and I see both in the case here as well as in your presentation, you used NPR to get um, get those mitral valve areas after the procedure and in the middle of the clip case. And I know that the interventionists are usually chomping at the bit to go, should we let go? Should we let go? So what kind of pointers would you give to someone who wants to start integrating NPR, both in guiding the procedure as well as in doing the assessment after the clips are placed? That's an excellent question. And um, I think it really comes down to the fact that in the heat of the moment where one needs to make this decision is not the time to learn. And historically, when one had to go off platform into sort of software launch, you really couldn't do this real time in the moment. But now all the vendors offer the ability to do real time imaging and plane manipulation, and you can do measurements consistent with your routine practice. And so in that context, I actually encourage my fellows to practice making multiple measurements, rapid plane adjustment on the pump run. So that when you're having to do it real time with time pressure on you, you've now been practicing in a location or a setting where there isn't this production pressure. And um, if one becomes facile with it, you can generate these numbers as quickly as you can do a 2D measurement. And there are some tips and tricks depending on the vendor to auto set up how you would like to orientate your planes to facilitate the speed with which you can achieve this. That's great. Those are very helpful hints, hints here. Um, now, uh, this is probably directed to Dr. Poulin as well as to Dr. Uh, Segal. Uh, you, you, Dr. Segal's presentation mainly focused on edge touch repair techniques um, with the clips and as well as the uh, transcatheter valve. I remember a few years ago, there was this whole discussion that perhaps we could actually do a complete repair with annuloplasty or uh, cords and so forth. Where do you guys both think the field is, is going with that? Are we actually looking at just an either or for TUR versus transcatheter valve? Or are we going to be going back to including some of these other techniques and putting $100,000 worth of, of material into people? I can I can give you my my two cents. I think I don't know if we really do know yet. There was a time where we thought that tear was the way to go, and then it kind of moved towards transcatheter valve. Um, I I still I still think it's going to be it's going to depend on the anatomy and many other things for patients. I don't think we quite know yet who which patients are going to benefit the most from one or the other. Um, but I don't know if we have some. There's actually the, some of the new valves actually look pretty promising, but they're still fairly new. So I think they're. Time will tell, but I, some of the new valves that are coming are going to be pretty good for our patients. Um, and some of the clips uh, that we have, especially the fourth generation, are pretty good. So I think it's going to be a, a, a mix of both. But I'd be happy to hear your thoughts as well. I personally think that um, there's been a huge amount of money invested in the space with a variety of technologies. And so I think it's going to be very patient stratified or patient specific. Some of the annular technologies look promising. Um, the actual valve replacement have some challenges with regards to LVT, LVOT obstruction. And then the edge-to-edge -edge repair addresses only one component of the, um, the entire valve apparatus. And so I think that um, this is not going to be as simple as uh, the aortic space, but I do think that with the amount of money that's been invested and the, the selection of technologies we're going to have available to us, we should be able to choose a device that's tailored to the best outcome for that specific patient. It will definitely not be a one size fits all. Dr. Scal. Oh, I think you're muted still. All right. I'm not sure he can hear me. So there is one other question from the audience here, and it goes back to the case that uh, was just presented. So perhaps Dr. Sharkey or, or uh, Dr. Nyman can even chime in on this. When the degree of residual MR is questionable, because there is shadowing from the device uh, from the from the, the catheters in the in the um, atrium, do you decide on a further clip or not uh, based on the degree of improvement in actual forward stroke volume? Do you want to comment on that? Oh, Dr. Sharkey, you're still on mute. Sorry. Uh, you know, so I think there's no one parameter that you look at. I think you have to look at it in totality, you know. And so, you know, I think, you know, if 
you're having a, a improved hemodynamics. You know, the V waves uh, that you can measure hemodynamically are much improved, but you're still seeing uh, some degree of, you know, uh, you know, moderate mitral regurgitation. You know, I don't think you'll go chasing that, uh, especially if you already have a, a gradient that might be marginal. Um, you know, so I think, you know, you need to take things in totality you know, how many clips have gone on, uh, what are the hemodynamics, you know, how much fluid has the patient gotten, are they truly optimized in terms of their goal, uh, uh, medical therapy, diuretics, and uh, all that. Perfect. I, I think that um, the the ones where you've had an obvious reduction in MR, those are the ones that are fairly easy. Let's let this go and move on. It's the ones where You've got questionable amount of residual MR and your gradients are borderline. And as I mentioned in my lecture, I think at that situation, it becomes hard to quantify how much of that gradient is because of the increased stroke volume because of the regurgitation. And so when you encounter that, one really has to go down to the point of measuring at the leaflet tips. Um, I suppose theoretically, you could measure the 3D volume of the LV and, and, and work out a true regurgitant volume and sort of try and figure out what your true quantified, quantified um, MR volume is. But the reality is that's cumbersome and takes time. So we tend not to do that. So the quickest thing is to actually measure the vena contractor and take that in context with um, the measured leaflet tip at the leaflet tips valve area of each orifice. And like I said, you don't want to go below a valve area of 1.9. And the gradients, there's a lot of gray area in the studies. Certainly, um, one has to also take the patient into context. If this is an attempt to keep the patient out of a heart failure admission and otherwise they're sedentary living in a wheelchair, you could, in theory, tolerate a slightly higher um, mitral valve gradient. But if this person's fit and active and independent, that patient's not going to tolerate mitral stenosis in the setting of someone that actively increases their cardiac output. So remain the physician, talk with your, your proceduralists, and you then make the decision about the second clip. Oh, and another, uh, you know, uh, that Charles alluded to is that our Doppler measurements are velocity-based measurements as opposed to, to to volume measurements. So, and at the end of the day, it's forward flow that really is going to make improvements uh, to these patients. So, doing something like a volumetric analysis as opposed to a velocity analysis that we use on color flow Doppler, you know, is is uh, you know quite important for these patients. I think one of the um, things that we do in our lab is we always make sure that the blood pressure is at, at the patient's regular blood pressure, not optimized under anesthetic before we actually make a decision on how much regurgitation is left. Because if their blood pressure is sitting around 90 and we're going to make that assessment, when they come off pumping their back at their 130, um, we're going to be very unhappy with the results there. So I think that's one of the other things that uh, that people have to keep in mind about these uh, lesions. Um, anything you want to add, Dr. Segal, before now that you've rejoined us, um, before we finish here? Yeah, I mean, we've done some cases where, you know, despite a significant reduction in um, MR and, uh, you know, uh, we've improved uh, uh, flow reversal in the pulmonary veins, we still see that um, the V waves, um, you know, that uh, uh, proceduralists are measuring directly in the left atrium are still high. So it's also important to rule out that there's um, any, you know, ventricular dysfunction in terms of um, diastolic dysfunction and how much fluids we've given to the patients during the case that may actually be contributing and confounding some of the results that we see in these cases. So, um, uh, you know, you start doubting yourself, you know, we are at the cusp of, you know, hitting four or five mean gradients. We've, we've reduced the MR significantly. So why, you know, the hemodynamics are not favoring the results, the echocardiographic results and those discrepancies should be, should be carefully sorted out. Excellent. So it's um it's past one o'clock, so I'm going to let everyone go for lunch. I'd like to thank Dr. Sharkey for creating this excellent session, as well as for Dr. Segal, Nyman, and Poulin, for, and, and, and Mahmood for being part of this. It's been a wonderful session, great ideas and, and talks here. Thanks. Thank you very thank much, you. Uh, Wendy. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Wendy, and uh, thanks to you know Charles Sankup and uh, Mary France for for uh, doing all those recordings. Uh, I think they came out very well. Yeah, thanks, team. Nicely done. Yeah. Thanks, absolutely. Thank you so much.